When climate deniers seek answers to the big questions, they turn to the smartest man in the whole world. Lord Christopher Monckton. Lord Monckton uh, is, um, I mean... Lord Christopher Monckton, former uh, science advisor to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. He's everywhere on the climate denial circuit. He's not a scientist. He's a classics major and journalist. How is it that he's been able to sell himself to climate deniers as their number one spokesman? First, like any good salesman, Lord Moncton knows his customer. I'm practicing to run for president. I understand that all I need is a nice, freshly minted Hawaiian birth certificate. He's an Arab. Obama was born in Kenya. Wake up! Wake up! Get your heads out of the freaking... And he's mastered some of the time-honored techniques for creating an air of mystery and authority. For instance... Quisivit enim Pilatus. That's right. Talk in Latin. It's been a time-honored technique for bedazzling the rubes for thousands of years. The Universitatis Comitiatum e Pluribus Unum. Once you've got him going with the Latin lingo, throw in some mathematical jargon. That's as good as Greek to most of them, and helps create the illusion of credibility. I am very well acquainted too with matters mathematical. I understand equations both of simple and quadratical. About binomial theorem, I'm teeming with a lot of news. To the goobers in your audience, it all sounds like magic. F of Z equals Z squared, or rather maps to Z squared, plus C, a complex number. This is an iterative equation. It goes round and round. The aim, of course, is to show that you're revealing hidden knowledge that proves what they've always known. They're smarter than all those crazy scientists and so-called experts. With the mini cheerful facts about the square of the hypotenuse. Once you've done that, they'll suck up and repeat anything you have to say. But just because he's a good salesman, doesn't mean he's wrong about the science. So let's examine a few of his lordship's claims. See there, the purple is the sea ice extent in 2007 at the summer minimum, then 2008, and then 2009, where the sea ice extent on September the 15th, just a couple of weeks ago, was 24% higher than it had been in 2007. You'd think a math whiz like Lord Moncton would understand a simple concept like the difference between surface area and volume. These animations from NASA satellite data show thick multi-year ice as the lightest white color. You can watch the seasons come and go from 2003 to 2008 and see why ice experts tell us that the total amount of ice is decreasing precipitously. But wait, there's more. Lord Moncton has some entertaining things to say about global temperature as well. The strong red line through the Jigliapidani data, that's known as the least squares linear regression trend. And what that looks to me like is a fairly hefty, and indeed it is, statistically significant rate of fall. We've had nine years of a global cooling trend since the 1st of January 2001. The global cooling canard is popular on the denier circuit, and in the fall of 2009, the Associated Press gave temperature data to four statistical experts and asked them to look for trends without telling them what the data was. They found no true temperature declines over time. They noted that cherry-picking a microtrend was particularly suspect as a means of analysis, and it is deceptive to say that the globe is cooling. Atmospheric scientist Dr. John Christie is among the 2% of working publishing climate scientists who do not think global warming is a problem. With his associate, Dr. Roy Spencer, he manages a satellite temperature database at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, which is the preferred data set for climate deniers. The data made news recently when it showed January 2010 as the warmest in the satellite record part of a long-term warming trend. I, I know no one up and down the East Coast will believe this graphic, but this was here 
0.72 degrees Celsius, so a degree and a half Fahrenheit, above normal for January. It was at least as warm, if not the warmest, all the way since 1999 right wow. there. But if you look at Quebec and Ontario and up in the, right. the Maritimes, that's two to four degrees above normal huh. here. Europe was cold. We had all the stories about that's how right. cold that's Europe right. was. But then you go back and you look at something different here. We'll use a green. Africa was hot. The Middle East was hot. China was hot. And so when you average all of the reds and all of the blues together, you end up with a warmer January. <laughs> Than we would have January is the warmest January on record for 11 years. And all those people who are saying, where's global warming? There it is. The warming continued as March 2010 became the warmest March on the record. Lord Moncton also has things to say about the reported melting of global ice sheets. How many of you have heard that Greenland is melting away? Yes, that's right, you've all heard that. Right. Here is a paper by Johannesson et al., a very diligent Danish researcher using laser altimetry. And what he found was that between 1992 and 2003, the average thickness of the vast Greenland ice sheet increased by two inches a year. A peer-reviewed study is always a good place to start. So let's see what this study actually said. Warmer temperatures actually increase accumulation at higher altitudes, due to more moisture being available. Lower altitudes see more melting. So the buildup that Lord Moncton refers to, according to Johannesson, is actually caused in part by global warming. The remote sensing satellites that Johannesson employed did a good job on measuring higher elevations, but not such a good job in resolving the lower elevations closer to the coast. The map that Lord Moncton refers to is color-coded, with the white area showing where the satellites were unable to obtain good measurements. In other words, the areas where we would expect the most melting to occur were exactly the places with the poorest data in this study. Johannesson tells us, we cannot make an integrated assessment of elevation changes, let alone ice volume and its equivalent sea level change, for the whole Greenland ice sheet, including its outlet glaciers, from these observations alone. Because the marginal areas are not measured completely using this satellite system. It is conceivable that pronounced ablation in low areas could offset elevation increases in the interior areas. Therefore, there's a need for continued monitoring using new satellites more advanced ones, and other remote sensing and field observations. The instruments Johannesson called for are now available. NASA's Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment Satellite System consists of two satellites that measure landmass changes with extreme sensitivity. The twin satellites detect gravitational changes in mass balance by measuring the change in distance between them, accurate to the width of a human red blood cell. A series of studies using this and other new data are now available. This animation shows measurements of mass loss on the Greenland ice sheet since 2003, the year of Johannesson's last reading. The graph in the lower left makes clear the steady, sustained ice loss trend. The results are consistent with a number of other published papers by different teams using different methods. This study uses yet another satellite system, NASA's ICESAT, to derive data about both the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. The results are consistent, clear, and unsettling. We find that dynamic thinning of glaciers now reaches all latitudes in Greenland, has intensified on key Antarctic grounding lines, has endured for decades after ice shelf collapse, penetrates far into the interior of each ice sheet and is spreading as ice shelves thin by ocean-driven melt. Lord Moncton's traveling snake oil show affords so much twaddle, bunkum, bollocks, and codswallop that I can't treat it all in one video. Part 2 will be premiering in a live webcast on Thursday, April 15th at climatetv.tv, part of a new live chat version of Climate Denial, Crock of the Week.